be talking to you today about smarter and cuter bots, like this cute little bot there. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first to give you a kind of gauge on the kind of projects that I enjoy doing, that I try and bring into my work, and that I also try and encourage other people to do as well through open source and speaking at things and stuff like that. Uh, so my name is Rachel White. I am Oho on Twitter. I'm a technical evangelist here at Microsoft, um, and I love cats. So I do a lot of cat-related projects. I have to get it out of the way at the beginning, otherwise it's going to go through the whole entire thing. Um, I also really love cute things in general, so I try and make cute stuff in no matter what I do. And I know you're probably thinking, like, how could code be cute? Well, I'm going to show you that today. Uh, I also really, really love Twitter bots. I think that they can be, like, everything ranging from educational to fun to inspiring, cute, and ridiculous and offensive if you want to go that route. Um, and we're going to be talking about primarily Twitter bots today, uh, a lot of different kinds. I'm going to like cram so much information into your head. I apologize in advance. Uh, a little bit more about me. Here's some more projects that I've worked on. Uh, I got involved with hardware in about 2014 um, at JSConf US, which sadly no longer exists in the United States. I saw a really cool, inspiring panel of people that were working with Johnny5 and making really cool JavaScript robotics, and I was like, I want to do that. And so I did. Um, I made this thing called RoboKitty. I told you there would be more cats. Um, this is the URL for the repository. Uh, it was my first hardware project. It was my first node project. Uh, it was the first time I used Socket.io. And uh, so that's why it's held together with tape and cardboard. Uh, and the whole time that I was making this project, I kind of was just breaking stuff, putting it back together, trying to figure out what I needed to do. And when I originally first made it, I couldn't make the servo stop turning, so the food just kept on dumping all over the floor, which was really bad for me, but really good for Rick. Um, but it works now. I wouldn't recommend using it to feed your cats, as there's no tests. So yeah, if you want to submit some, go, go ahead. Um, I'm also really into glitch art. My degree is actually in design, but I am a self-taught programmer. I've been programming for about 16 years. Uh, this is some of the art that I've made, where I took glitch art, interlaced it, printed it out, interlaced, and overlaid it with lenticular plastic so that when you turn it, you get the same idea as if you were viewing it on the screen. I'm also pretty into video games. Uh, this is a game that I will probably never finish about my cat, Rick. Uh, it's called Rick's Big Day, and it's utilizing a JavaScript framework called Phaser, which allows you to make WebGL canvas-based games with HTML and JavaScript. Um, Rick's Big Day is about Rick's Big Day running around my apartment. Uh, the thing above Rick is a KitchenAid mixer, in case you had any other assumptions about that. Uh, <laughs> Basically, he just walks around my apartment and plays with stuff and gets points and then naps. So it's really just like a video game about a day in the life of a cat. Um, like I said before, I'm super into cute Twitter bots. Um, here's one that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later that I've made. It's at is really cute. Um, all it does is whenever people follow it, it gives them a little compliment and sends them a cow emoji. And then if they talk to it, it gives them more compliments. And it's just really fun and cute. All right, so let's talk about some notable bot types. Um, before we get into talking about the primary uh, Twitter bots that you're going to encounter, I wanted to talk about machine learning a little bit, because I think there's a big misconception about what ML and uh, natural language processing is. So we're going to go over that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about Markov chain bots, corpus-fed bots, and generative image bots, and my personal favorite, just plain weird bots. All right, so what is machine learning? Machine learning is the subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So what, what is it? This is not machine learning. I just kind of wanted to have a robot building a uh, animal balloon. Um, but machine learning is within the field of data analytics. Machine learning is a method used to devise complex models and algorithms that lend themselves to prediction. In commercial use, this is known as predictive analysis. So um, 
I feel like a lot of corporations use machine learning and you might not even realize it. It's especially used with a lot of finance where they're doing predictive modeling for data sets of like, what can our projected um, you know, revenue be for the next year? Or it's used with emotional analysis in Twitter streams. So um, if a company is wanting to do better customer service, they can do a widespread analysis of the sentiment of, are these people saying like, I hate this thing or this thing is really great? Like, what is it going to be? And it's there's so much different types of things that you can use from it. Also, every single time you're like, going to fill out a form and it's like, give me all of the street signs or all of the sushi things. And sometimes it's really bad. That's because it's trying to train the model so that it knows um, what those things should look like. So you're actually even sometimes participating in helping a computer trained model become smarter by proving that you're not a robot. So uh, these analytical models allow researchers, data scientists, engineers, and analysis and analysts to produce reliable, repeatable decisions and results and uncover hidden insights through the learning from historical relationships and trends in the data. You know, sometimes those statistics don't always uh, work. You know, sometimes exit polls don't really give us great data. Uh, this is a example of what a kind of machine learning algorithm looks like, where it's looking for trends in the data and then finding a common median or the sine wave going for, you know, whatever this may be, rain, I don't know. I didn't check, I didn't read the article that well. <laughs> so um, whenever you're like looking at a company that's trying to package you certain kinds of machine learning stuff, they're often more simplified. Like people aren't gonna be like, hey, would you like to buy some machine learning? Because that makes no sense. Uh, so they usually take it down and break it up into smaller pieces. Um, as someone who used to work at IBM and now works at Microsoft, I know kind of a lot about these things. Um, the most often uh, offered services that you will encounter for people like wanting to help you analyze some data are computer vision, which you know knows what an image is based off of a learned model, pre predictive text, so on your phone. Um, I don't know if, if anybody has an iPhone and you've enabled predictive text. It's really fun if you like just keep on hitting it and seeing what kind of generative thing it's going to make. Like, I'm gonna open mine up really quick and look. This might not be good, so I might not share it with you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good enough to get a job. LOL, like, <laughs> it, it knows the kind of things that you say. Um, facial detection, like I said, emotional analysis. Deep learning, which is often used in more, um, like, healthcare and educational stuff where they need to analyze a ton of stuff, neural networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so on, there's, there's like a lot, there's a lot. Um, but they're still trained models, they still require some sort of input from a human being. And I think this is the part that people don't understand. They think that these computers are just like getting fed all this data and somehow they're like, oh, I'm, this is totally, you know, this is a picture of a, Sad clown, I don't know. But no, you have to like give it instructions in order for it to do something. So now we're gonna talk about natural language processing after I drink some water, because these are a lot of text. So modern NLP algorithms are based on machine learning, uh, especially statistical machine learning. The paradigm of machine learning is different from that of most prior attempts at language processing. Prior implementations of language processing tasks typically involve the direct hand coding of large sets of rules, which sounds terrible to me. So now it, it's a lot smarter for us to be able to make these things more intuitive. There's already set algorithms that people have generated based off of parts of speech or other rules. So the machine learning paradigm calls instead for using general learning algorithms often, although not always grounded in statistical inference, to automatically learn such rules through the anal analysis of large corpora of typical real-world examples. Uh, a corpus, plural corpora, is a set of documents or sometimes individual sentences that have been hand annotated with the correct values to be learned. So um, <laughs> this is an embarrassing thing for me to admit. Uh, I skipped the fourth grade, which isn't an embarrassing part, but that's when we learned the parts of speech. So I don't know the parts of speech. So that's kind of bad for me if I was trying to like construct actual smart natural language things based off of like adverbs and adjectives and that kind of stuff. But 
Luckily, I don't have to do that work. Somebody already did. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that natural language processing is helpful for. Um, some types of NLP, linguistic analysis, language understanding, text analytics, analyzing tone. Um, I don't know if you've ever participated in one of those Twitter bot things where you authenticate your feed and it's like, have you been naughty or nice? Are you getting coal for Christmas? And you're like, yeah, this sounds like something I want to give my data to. All it's doing mm -hmm. is like pulling in a ton of your text, analyzing it, seeing how often you said a bad word. And then, you know, whatever they decided is the threshold, you are either getting coal or stuff you don't need. So that's the kind of stuff that analyzing tone is. All right, now we're going to move on to some more fun, less brain hurting examples. Um, we're going to talk about Markov chains for a little bit. Uh, so what are Markov chains? <sighs> <laughs> Markov chains are a stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state attained in the previous event. Here's a little helpful diagram um, that will make more sense in a second. So with these two states, state A and B, in our state space, there are four possible transitions, not two, because a state can transition back into itself. So if we're at A, we can transition to B or stay at A. And if we're at B, we can transition to A or stay at B. Markov chains are often used in natural language processing a lot, especially with the um, predictive text or um, like the parts of speech stuff that I don't understand, which is why I was like, oh, that, yeah, that makes sense. Um, you might have seen a lot of examples of Markov chain bots, especially um, with ebooks accounts. Ebooks accounts are like the perfect, most understandable uh, way to express what a Markov chain is. You have your set of rules with the different states, and there's a bunch of libraries that are already pre written that you can just like authenticate your Twitter account with. Um, do a data dump, which if you had a really old Twitter account, takes like three days to get it. But then it feeds in and um, generates you know, an eBooks account. And I have an eBooks account for my own account. And I say enough like nonsensical stuff as it is, so my eBooks account is even better. Um, and I pulled three of my favorite generated, generated tweets that I promise you I did not say <laughs> uh, originally. Uh, the kitties are being bad. <laughs> So I'm going to use Microsoft Tech. I had a lovely night full of so many things that I want to be satire. <laughs> and uh, I can be provoked by a bird. <laughs> I think we all can. Uh, so the, the next type of bots that I'm going to be talking to you about are corpus-fed bots. So what are those? Uh, in linguistics, a corpus, plural corpora, or text corpus, is a large and structured set of texts, nowadays usually electronically stored and processed, and they're used to do statistical analysis and hypothesis testing, checking occurrences of validating linguistic rules, like we've said about a bunch of other things, there's always rules within a specific language territory, but my favorite ones are the ones that make no sense. So there's no rules, you just have a huge set of data, um, you grab random parts of it, and it creates uh, things in a more generalized way. So the bot that I showed you really early on, um, uh, if you go to github.com slash Darius K slash Corpora, this is tiny subversions on Twitter, and they have an amazing corpus repository that anybody can report to, uh, or like open PRs, and they have stuff from art to foods, to humans, to mythology. So if you were like, oh wow, I really want to make a Twitter bot about the god of bananas, you could just grab mythology and food and like make mashups of a bunch of different kinds. And even all of these folders have subfolders of more specific stuff. And so this is the example of what I used to make this cute bot. Um, Hi, I like your cute style. Baby animals are pretty cute, but you're cuter. Um, that kind of stuff. And I wanted to show you how this was made really quick. So this is my really cute bot. Uh, is this large enough for people to see, or should I try and make it a little bigger? Is that good? Bigger? OK, cool. So um, this is actually just the bot.js file, which is the bulk of my bot. Um, I'm going to skip over the things that we're going to talk about later. 
But um, for this, I just am getting the length of a certain list, and then it's a my list is an array of you know comma delineated stuff, and it's randomly picking one from whatever the length of the list is, and I'm using that with these four things in here. Um, so there's the calmoji, there's the greeting, there's the compliment, and the replies. And if you go in here to content, like this is how easy it is to make these kind of bots. All I have is a module exports with all my little things and a lot of escape characters for like the little arm things. Um, so it randomly picks one of those each time. And then if we go into bot.js, we come in, we're gonna ignore what the streams are for now. So basically it's, um, oh, it messed up my, don't make fun of my indentation. I don't know why this is like this. So all it's doing is grabbing those random things that I have based off of this dot pick in the thing that I constructed at the top. Oh yeah, fix this entire call, super ugly, but hey, now you can see my thought process. Um, and it's watching the stream and sending it out whenever people check that stuff. So that's, that's all that that whole entire bot is, and people were super entertained by that silly little thing. I remember how to start from the slide I'm on, which is good. All right, so next we're gonna talk about generative image bots. There's a lot, a lot of different kinds of generative image bots. Um, I'm gonna be telling you about SVG generative bots through Tracery. Uh, Tracery is this really awesome library that was originally started for um, you know, making generative stories based off of grammar rules. And some genius figured out, oh wait, SVGs are kind of structured like sentences. There's words in there. So they created rules based off of like points in the SVG with colors and gradients so that it can create a generative um, image based off of the set of rules that you set it on each time. Um, there's also generative image bots that are compiled through image magic and graphics magic, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and then there's altering raw image binaries. So I don't know if you've ever just like opened up a JPEG inside a text pad and you see like all of the raw data and you're swapping out whatever, deleting whatever, and then you open the image back up and you're like, oh, that looks really cool. So that's, that's pretty much, there's a bunch of like glitchy bots that do that kind of stuff. Here's a, an example of some of the SVG generative bots. This is Tiny Neighbor, uh, Amanda Glisson. I don't know if I'm saying her last name right. <laughs> she made this uh, using uh, a site that I'll show you in a second. So basically every single time that Tiny Neighbor tweets out, it's the same file for the SVG. And like, even though it looks like pixel art, it's still all SVG and it puts like the porch in a different place. It puts different plants on there, different siding, different stones. It changes the color, it changes the color of the background. It's, it's really impressive. Like I don't even, I can't even really wrap my head around how tracery works that well yet. Um, here's another bot made with tracery that you might be more familiar with. Um, it's called Soft Landscapes. It creates very soft and cute, uh, kind of like, I don't know, would this be like chill wavy <laughs> soft landscapes? Uh, so Cheap Bots Done Quick is a site that uh, gives you source code examples about how to use tracery. Uh, this is actually the source code for Soft Landscapes. It's not all of it, but I couldn't fit it on there. Uh, and you can just see like a, how many different find and replaces they're doing for all of the different groups and colors and mountains. And it's impressive, but it takes a lot of work for it to get that impressive. Now we're gonna talk about weird bots. What are they? I don't know, they're just weird. Um, so a lot of corpus fed text, random images, general nonsensical Markov chains for the purpose of being weird and fun. So a lot of them like follow along loosely with the kind of rules of the stuff that we talked about previously, but they don't adhere to them strictly and they might not make any sense anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And here's some of my favorite ones. There's Claromancer. Uh, ask me a question and I will open a channel to the dimension for an answer. And it just tweets out stuff like this. Sometimes it'll be little like art. Sometimes it'll be all emojis. I don't know what their source is, so I don't know how they're doing this. It might even just be a person. It might be God tributes, who knows? And my personal favorite, ominous Zoom. <laughs> it's good every time, too. Oh, I should have pointed this out earlier, but the bottom left is the source for all the stuff that I've been telling you, but I'll put my slides online. You'll be able to follow along. It'll, it'll all work out in the end. All right, 
So, what are we gonna make? Because we're gonna make a bot. Well, I already made it, but I'm gonna tell you how I made it, and then you can all pretend like you helped, I guess. So, we're making a Twitter bot. We'll be utilizing Twitter's streaming APIs, graphics magic, Microsoft's cognitive services, specifically the Face API, which is a uh, subset of our like machine learning cognitive service offerings. And yeah, so let's just dive right into the info dump. Um, we are going to be using Twit. Twit is this really amazing repository. Uh, it is. It will make it so easy that if you left right now and didn't listen to the rest of my talk, you can make a Twitter bot in like 30 minutes. But please don't do that. Um, you have to make sure that you've node and npm installed. This is the URL for Twit. And then you have to sign up for the Twitter app for off tokens. So let's see what that looks like right now. And don't steal my tokens, because I'm going to delete them after the talk. All right, so this is Twit. It's really great. It's super easy to use. Um, I usually hate saying things are easy to use, but if I say it's easy, you should believe me, because I'm not that great at this stuff. <laughs> um, so there's Twit. You require it in, and then you have a new instance of it, and you throw in all your consumer keys and secrets and tokens. Um, and then it goes into the REST APIs and the streaming APIs, which um, I'll go into in depth with in a second. And in order to create an application with Twitter, you have to have your phone number um, attached to your account. If you don't want to have your phone number attached to the account, you can use a Google Hangout number or a Twilio account, which is really good if you have people that are creepy and know your phone number. Every time you make an app, they follow it. It's not fun. Um, so you create an app. I already made one. I already generated all of these tokens. Uh, here's my API key. Not for long. And then here is the rest of these access tokens. So you grab all this stuff and you bring it back in. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. I'm going to show you how that works. Um, so here's a demo of Twit. I grabbed all that stuff and pasted it in there. I required Twit. And I'm going to post an update, which is just Twitter's REST API, since we're not opening up a stream. And I'm going to say, I'm at Buzz.js and tweeting this from a bot. Yay, so you know that I'm not faking it. We're going to save that really quick. I'll go to my Twitter, refresh it so you know that I didn't say anything yet. I'm really glad I haven't said anything horrible lately. OK, so the last thing that I said is, hi, I'm up next at Buzz.js. So is this big enough, or do you want it bigger? All right. Is that good? No, bigger? All right. I thought I made it bigger when I was testing this out earlier, but is that good? OK, there's not going to be that much stuff to look at in here, I promise. So OK, so am I in the right folder? I am. All right, we want to run node twit1.js. We're waiting. Cool, so it returned the object of the stuff that it just sent out. It did an error, which is great. Um, and then let's refresh this really quick. I'm at Buzz.js and tweeting this from a bot. Yay! OK, so we just made a Twitter bot. We're done. Uh, but we're going to add more stuff to it. That's, that's all you need in order to like send a tweet from a bot. And you can get way more involved with it. Uh, we will, <laughs> eventually. Um, but that's, like, that's the bare minimum. Once you have all that stuff set up, then you can get way more into the streaming and the REST APIs which I'll show you a little bit right here. Um, Twitter has documentation for all of the different endpoints that you can hit. It's good for finding uh, relational information to who may be following this person, um, who has used this hashtag, who has said this word. So like, if you ever say stuff, if you ever say like JavaScript and then JavaScript Daily or any of those other sites fave it, it's because they're like running something like this with a streaming API, getting any mentions of certain stuff. So. It can be kind of annoying uh, if it's done to you. But if you're making something cool, then it's fine. Um, and then the streaming API, <laughs> so the REST API is obviously like get and post. But the streaming API is a little bit different. Um, I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. All right, so um, this, this code right here is just streaming a sample of public statuses. So if I had this, uh, I don't want to do that because too many people say not good things to me. 
Um, if you have the stream and you ran that code, what it would do is it would just look at the public thing and it would be totally open until you kill the command. And it would just, uh, you know, statuses filter, what's a more to topical one? We'll be using like replies. So it would be running and it's open and every time somebody replies, it would log it in the console. So it, there's a lot that you can do with this like starting point and it's super helpful. All right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about for the next part of our bot is graphics magic. Who has used graphics magic or image magic? Raise your hand. I'm sorry for all of you. Um, so graphics magic is a tool to create, edit, and compose or composite images. It's super versatile. You can access it from the CLI or C, C++, Lua, Perl, PHP, Python, TCL, Ruby, Windows.net, or Windows.com programming interfaces a lot. It does a lot. There's a node port of it that you can use uh, via npm install gm, but it's kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, down and up sampling of the images are super poor quality. Uh, it requires some hacky workarounds. In node, you've got to use a ton of callbacks in order to do multiple compositing. And to host them on server, you have to be able to install some binaries, which Depending on your host, they may or may not uh, support that. So I'm going to show you what that looks like because I have a fun demo for this one too. So here is Graphics Magic, the, well, the, uh, the one that you can install via NPM. Um, you just NPM install GM into the project that you want and you require it in. Usually you need a FS, which I never remember, file something. I never remember what that one's for, but it doesn't matter because it does it for you. It lets you save the file to your local folder or repository or whatever you're doing it in. Um, and then the kind of stuff that Graphics Magic does is you can combine images, you can rotate them, you can draw on them, crop them, size them up. It's just like a, pretty much an image editor built in to your uh, code. So the demo that I have for you is... Combine.js. So all we did is we were requiring in Graphics Magic, um, and then what we're doing is we are taking cats.jpg. This is Rick and Reset, and in cats.jpg, what we're doing is we're taking overlay.png, which I can't show you because it ruins the surprise, and we're temporarily writing it to tmp.png because, like I said, you got to do weird, weird callbacks and like nested things when you're combining images. And then we're taking cats.jpg and we're drawing over cats.jpg um, at starting at xy00 and going until this xy, which is the width and height of the image. And we're writing over it with uh, tmp.png, or we're writing over it with overlay.png, which has been temporarily rewritten as tmp.png. And then we're writing it as output.jpg. Like I, I said, graph graphics magic is really easy, right? So, all right, let's do, oh, and just so you can know, uh, output.jpg does not exist right now, so I am not lying. I'm gonna prove this for every single time we go through. So node combine.js, we're running through, and it's done. And now we have output.jpg, and it says, they're good cats, Brent. <laughs> so that's that's a basic explanation of how graphics magic works. All right, moving on. That was the wrong key. Now I'm going to talk to you about Microsoft's Cognitive Services. It's rad. Um, it's a whole suite of machine learning REST APIs. If you ever wanted to try out machine learning or uh, you know, and we're like, this is hard, I don't get it. This makes it super easy. Um, there's a ton of them. There's computer vision, content moderator, emotion, face, video, Bing speech, custom recognition, speaker recognition, Bing spell check, language understanding, linguistic analysis, text analytics, translator, WebLM, academic, entity linking, knowledge exploration, recommendations, and then a lot of other Bing things. Um, basically, it just like really covers every base, especially with like computer vision and um, NLP. So there's something for everyone. Uh, it's also super easy to use. If you know how to hit an endpoint, you can use anything. They're all, they're the REST APIs. Uh, we're gonna use the face API. Um, but before we show you how the face API works, 
I would like to show you how the demos are on the site because that makes it even easier. So the site is microsoft.com slash cognitive services if you want to go and try the demos out. Um, I'm going to use the face API, but that's probably not the right URL. All right. So the really cool thing about it is if you don't want to like code to try it out, you can upload whatever image you want. So the face API is really cool because it gives you like all of these X, Y positions of stuff. Um, for a lot of different landmarks on the face, there's 27. So um, in our case, I already have it saved on my browser because that's easier. Excuse me. So uh, yeah, it detects one or more human faces in an image and it gets back face rectangles for where in the image the faces are. I think it supports like a lot. I don't remember how many. It's a, it's a number that makes sense in terms of math and computing, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, so along with the facial attributes, it also does predictions of facial features. Um, the face attribute features available are, like we were talking about earlier, a model is only as good as it's been trained, so there are issues with assumptions on a lot of these. Um, there's age, gender, pose, smile, and facial hair, along with 27 landmarks for each face in the image. Um, so let's let's try it out. I took this flattering photo of myself and uh, ran it through the web browser example that we just gave you, and it gave me back the face, face rectangle. And I have a face, so it knows where it is. It does not do cat faces, but believe me, I have considered trying to train a computer vision model to do facial detection on cats. My cats are very hard to detect their faces, so it's not that easy. Um, but I also have an example of how the face API works and the output that you get back. So there's this library called Project Oxford that makes it super easy for you to use a lot of our cognitive services. Um, basically, especially with like the facial detection stuff, you just grab your key and you run it um, and it, you just call this thing client face detect. And we're using this other exceedingly a flattering photo of myself and running it through face detect and I'm saying I want it to guess how old I am. I want it to tell me where my face landmarks are and tell me what my head pose is. So please work. It might take a second. Cool. So we get this object back and it gives me um, this is the face rectangle. It's at 122x, 158y, and goes to, you know, width and height from that out. And it goes down into eye stuff, mouths, mouths, <laughs> mouths, eyebrows. It gets super, uh, super, super detailed. And then it has like the pitch rolling all of my head and it thinks I'm 25, which I will take. So, you know, you, you win some and you lose some with cognitive services. And today I win. All right. So. I'm sure, I'm sure that you're all like, okay, Rachel, what exactly are we making? Well, much like Usagi was already a cute teenage girl and then she transformed into cuter Sailor Moon, we're gonna make a magical and cute image bot to transform all of our already cute selves into a cuter version of ourselves. And it is magical and cute image bot. Um, I was super inspired by Puri Booths. Um, these are super popular in uh, Japan and Korea, and there's one in New York at Chinatown Fair. And what it does is it knows where your face is, and it like smooths your skin out, and it makes you look really good or sometimes scary. I'm actually too pale for the ones in Japan, and so I just have like giant eyes and a really, I didn't put that picture on there for a reason, but um, it, it's just really fun, and it lets you like put makeup on and eyelashes and change your hair color. And I was like, how do I do that? But for Twitter, and so uh, I'll show you how I did that. And this is the last thing, we're almost done. So you can be excited. All right, so we're taking everything that we just learned. We're using Twit, we're using Graphics Magic, we're using the Face API, and we're combining all of it. Um, I'm not gonna go over everything in here because there is a lot, uh, but I'll try and touch on it. Um, so basically, we're using Twit. Uh, this has my uh, credentials in there. It says I'm using the Twitter stream for the user. Um, this is your like regular node stuff. 
Um, and then I'm requiring in face, which is face.js, which is doing all of my compositing inside of graphics magic. So I'm also rate handling it because I don't want to hit Twitter's limit if I have too many people tweeting at me. It would be horrible to just like send out so many pictures at once. It would probably break. So we're setting it to a specific amount of time and also creating a queue. So um, I'm opening up my stream and then whenever anybody tweets, I'm doing a couple checks for stuff. Um, I'm grabbing the message object and finding out the user's uh, screen name and the specific string for their uh, tweet. And then I'm saying if the message is in reply to me, magical and cute, then I'm going to look up their friendships and make sure that they're following me. Um, with Twitter bots, you always want to, especially Twitter bots that you're going to have interactivity with other users, you have to make sure that they follow you, otherwise you'll get essentially shadow banned. Um, you won't be searchable, people won't get notified whenever you reply to them, so it's an important step that you need to do. Um, so if they are following me, then we can proceed if the message is in reply to me, and there is media attached, then we're going to grab that media URL. We already have the status ID and the screen name, so we're gonna enqueue that task up for it to be checked later. Um, the other checks in here that I'm doing is if they're following me, but they didn't send me an image, I need to tell them to, and then if they're not following me, um, I tell them to follow me. So once we have this stuff in the queue, it's uh, the enqueue task grabs the URL, the status ID, and the screen name, and then, you know, it gets ran uh, every so often. And then we run task. And so what the task does is it grabs the media URL, which is the absolute path to the image that they had sent to you on Twitter. It saves it locally, and then we're sending it over to face.js. So inside face.js, we're using that similar uh, array prototype pick that I showed you before that grabs a random thing from a list, and I'm using that for the ears, the nose, and the cheeks, and the background image, which I hand drew a bunch, and they're all in these lists, which look, well, there's more in the other lists, but they all look like this, so that they're picking a random one for each thing and overlaying it on the image. Um, and then we're going through, whoo, sorry. We're detecting the face, I'm doing some math uh, where Depending on where the XY coordinates are, I'm doing some subtra subtraction to get a midpoint so that I know where to overlay the certain things for the nose and the cheeks and the ears. Otherwise, you would have like, if I did the exact point, it would be really off center and grotesque. It would turn into a weird Twitter bot instead of a cute Twitter bot. Um, so like I said with graphics magic, there's a ton of callbacks that are happening. And it's, it's the same exact thing for each iteration of it. I'm grabbing a random one, I'm combining the images, I'm determining you know, the X, Y positions and how uh, wide and how high it needs to be. And we're just running through that until we get to the last one where we're sending that cuter image back over to the server. And so now we're finally ready to send the tweet back to the person. Um, we're grabbing the image that we had just saved, we're uploading it, uh, the alt text is def some cuties. <laughs> I forgot that I did that. Um, and then we're just uh, actually uh, sending a post. So I'm posting back in reply to the person that sent me the tweet so that it's able to read as threaded. And um, it's just going to at reply their name. And then it's going to post the image. So let me show you what that looks like. That's don't look yet. <laughs> so that magical and cute image bot works like this. If I tweet a picture at myself, it comes back. It's kind of hard to see on the image, but it has blushed cheeks, it has a cool nose, it has fun ears, and then a smushed little background down at the bottom. Uh, I launched it in November. People immediately tried to break it. Like, they, so many cat faces, like random faces. It doesn't work as good as Snapchat's face swap thing. Um, sometimes it glitched out. So, like, if you take a picture of yourself now and you have people behind you that have, like, partially, part, not partial faces, but, like, obscured faces, you might get, like, a big giant nose in one side. And it works good most of the time. So if you want to try it out, you can follow it at, at Magical and Cute. Uh, tweet a selfie at it. Uh, if you have, like, swoopy bangs that cover your eyes, you got to make sure that all features of your face are visible. Um, and yeah, that, that is my bot. Thank you. If, uh, if you want to keep up with the other weird and cute things that I do, my Twitter name is Oho, Rachel is awesome, and I'm cool online, or my narcissistic domain names, and uh, 
The source code for this bot is on my GitHub, and aka.ms slash smarterandcuter is where you can find the slides for this talk. Any questions? Um, so I have a question about uh, the Microsoft Cognitive Services API. Sure. Um, so you mentioned earlier that with machine learning, the model has to get better, and the way for it to get better is with people using it. And uh -huh. So is there any way for the API to receive feedback? Like, is this age accurate, um, or how does it get better over time? I think that it's more determined from uh, the people that utilize it on a consumer level where there's feedback to be able to, on a hobby level. Uh, I haven't been able to do that yet, but I think at the point that the, um, the APIs go live, it's pretty much a trained model at that point. It, there's always like room to grow, but it's, it's pretty set in stone once they're letting like uh, consumers that are like developer level use it. I'm happy it told me I'm 25. <laughs> Anybody else? Yay. Thank you.